Welcome everybody. My name is Luis Fraga, the director of the Institute for Latino Studies and, be, and on behalf of Silvia Paloma Garcia Lopez, associate director, uh, Idalia Maldonado, our events coordinator, Maribel Rodriguez, our staff accountant, whom you should all know, and uh, because she processes money. <laughs> and um, Lauren Melancon, our communication specialist, welcome. We, as you know, have a tradition that twice a semester, we invite one of our current faculty members to come and talk about their research as a way of helping us understand an idea that they are pursuing. This event is a little more special than that in that we are welcoming an incoming faculty member who will be a new assistant professor next year starting July 1. That is, the appointment doesn't start until August 20th, but he starts getting paid as of July 1. Um, yeah, which is good. <laughs> um, a person I'm going to introduce as Professor David Cortez. David is a native of Brownsville, Texas, um, the place where the judge made the decision a couple of years ago to not continue the DAPA program because it was found unconstitutional. Th that person is not at all related to our speaker of today. That's a joke, given David's talk. Um, David's, uh, David's parents um, were born in Texas as well. His grandparents immigrated from Mexico, but the family actually goes back to the current South Texas area, owning a ranch, to the time before Texas was an independent republic and was still part of Mexico. Um, he graduated from Hannah High School in Brownsville, Texas. He is a graduate of the University of Texas Pan American, graduated from there in 2011. Um, his mom graduated from that same university earlier. And he recently, in 2017, received his PhD from Cornell University. We should all clap for that. <laughs> he is currently a postdoctoral research associate in the Institute for International and Regional Studies at Princeton, where he has been um, for the entire year. His work has been funded by the National Science Foundation through its Graduate Research Fellowship. He has a book manuscript that he's working on. He's going to tease us with a portion of that today. That book manuscript, and if we're lucky and we have time and I stop introducing him, he has a magnificent set of slides that helps us understand the title and the topic and the subject and the very deep analysis of his book manuscript that is entitled Broken Mirrors, Identity, Duty, and Belonging in the Age of the New Latino Latinx Migra. The title of his talk today is Latinxes in La Migra why they join and why it matters in the age of Trump. And you should all know that David is one of the kindest, smartest young political scientists in the nation today. We were very lucky to be able to convince him to join our faculty and not go somewhere else. So we are extremely proud and privileged and humbled that he will join our faculty in the fall. And um, David, with um, all heartfelt thanks for uh, coming here to visit with us. Um, let him know how much you love him and appreciate him with an appropriately warm Notre Dame welcome. David Cortez. Thank you. That's a really kind introduction, Luis. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I want to start by, by thanking the Institute for Latino Studies for inviting me out. Um, I'm, this is a dual function trip. Tomorrow I'll be uh, tr uh, cruising around South Bend looking for apartments uh, <laughs> uh, so that my wife, daughter, and I can settle in here. Um, so today's talk uh, is a bit different than the one that you uh, may have seen. Uh, the title, at least, is a bit different uh, than the one you may have seen on the flyers. Uh, and I thought this, this talk might be a little bit more appropriate for the uh, current 
uh, political environment uh, for the moment that we find ourselves in. And, um, and so we'll just go ahead and get started. And I, I, this is actually a manuscript I'm preparing as a, uh, 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 an article length uh, piece for submission. Um, and so any questions, uh, comments, and suggestions on how I can strengthen it, uh, if you think the evidence is compelling and uh, the argument is sound, uh, I'd appreciate it. All right, so sorry to do this to you. I didn't think the screen was going to be this big. Uh, <laughs> No one could have accused uh, then-candidate Donald Trump of knowing too much about immigration. Uh, despite the catchphrases that he, you know, uh, parroted on every uh, cable news network interview and uh, debate stage in between, uh, he was perhaps not surprisingly short on details. Uh, not one for talking about how he intended to do things, uh, or how he was going to get Mexico to pay for the, the wall that he was proposing. But on the morning of uh, uh, November 11th, 2015, uh, on the set of Morning Joe, he made a statement that belied even a surface level understanding of immigration and immigration policy in the United States. Pressed by Mika Brzezinski on uh, how he intended to deport from the country 11 million undocumented persons, uh, Donald Trump responded with, well, we're going to have a deportation force. And of course, as tended to happen during the campaign, everybody did uh, his work for him in the media and spread that message across and it, of course, uh, uh, became huge news, at least for the day, until the next controversy, the next statement uh, made the news. But what struck me about this statement was that I could only imagine his surprise when he found out that we already have a deportation force, and that we have for more than 100 years in this country. Deportation has been central to immigration policy since the turn of the 20th century. And today, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the, the legacy of the Immigration and Naturalization Service, is that deportation force. Now, aside from his surprise at that news, I can only imagine his surprise given his distaste and public uh, uh, denunciation of Federal Judge Curiel um, for being maybe too Mexican uh, to be a judge. Uh, I could only imagine his surprise when he found out that his deportation force was disproportionately comprised by Latinos. Sad. <laughs> so, in fact, today, more than any other period in history, the uniform divisions of federal immigration law enforcement agencies reflect the demographics of the populations they police. Across the agencies charged with immigration law enforcement, namely uh, Border Patrol and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, Latinos are overrepresented relative to their proportion of both the overall federal workforce and the general population. With ICE enforcement and removal operations, the unit dedicated to deportation and apprehensions, uh, at nearly 30% Latino and Border Patrol nearly 50. Once an exclusively white enterprise that was viewed for much of the 20th century as a foreign occupying force in the borderlands and referred to uh, pejoratively probably uh, as La Migra, the last 40 to 45 years have uh, seen significant change uh, in the nation's immigration law enforcement machinery. And given birth to this, the emergence of, of what I've taken to calling the new Latino Migra. I know it says Latinx, but uh, you'll pardon my use of, of Latino still. Now, perhaps most fascinating about this demographic shift is that it's taken place in the context that it has, amidst a historically problematic relationship between Latinos and immigration law enforcement agencies. It's a relationship marred by violence and intimidation in which such agencies have never solely policed migration, but rather indiscriminately blanketed Latino communities in a shroud of surveillance, policing, and battlefield technology. These two pictures uh, uh, show two dirigible drones flying over the highway, the border highway in South Texas. 
Um, now, despite the tint of these pictures, they're not, you know, 40, 50 years old. These were from uh, last year. I highlight this point to, to illustrate the fact that despite the emergence of this less ethnically homogenous immigration law enforcement workforce, the new Latino migra finds itself today the steward of a long-standing but most importantly ongoing racial project that continues to tie Latino identity to criminality and violently relegate Latinos in the communities in which they live to this perpetual state of otherness, this perpetual foreignness. Which raises questions why, or raises the question of why Latinos elect to work for agencies that have and continue to systematically target the communities to which they belong. Now, extant scholarship on the topic is pretty clear. Ethnic identity is irrelevant. The answer is simple to these authors. Josiah Heyman, an anthropologist who uh, prior to this point had the uh, uh, largest study of Latino immigration agents uh, uh, ever conducted, basically argued that Latinos who work in immigration law enforcement lack a sense of or connection to their ethnic identity. And beyond this, a relative distance from the immigrant experience precluded them from any kind of empathy for or, or connection with the people that they come into contact with. And on top of that, or perhaps because of that, that Latinos who work in these positions are generally immigration restrictionists. They favor harsher immigration uh, policy, hardened immigration policy. For Garcia Hernandez, who's a legal scholar, actually uh, born and raised in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, which may paint his uh, perception of the men and women who enter these positions. Um, Latinos who work in immigration enforcement do so because they've internalized the racial biases and the uh, 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 negative stereotypes uh, used to characterize Latinos generally basically of the quote unquote oppressor. So drawing on Paulo Freire's work, uh, he basically says that Latinos who work in these positions see themselves not as Latinos, but as white people. See themselves as members of an inside class. Correa and Thomas, a group of sociologists, uh, basically fall in line with uh, Josiah Hammond's work and argue that Latinos who work in immigration enforcement do so because they have dissociated themselves from their ethnic identities, given a conflation of Mexicanness or Latinoness with criminality and anxiety over terrorism. But what I argue here is that, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, so put together, all of these uh, authors basically say that to understand the Latino immigration agent, we have to look at them as they see themselves. Not as Latinos, but as citizens, insiders, soldiers, and to look at the street level bureaucracy work in political science, they consider themselves just agents of the state. But what I argue here is that what's missing from this work is a clear distinction between two distinct processes. And that's why Latinos work in immigration law enforcement and how they actually do the work once they've enlisted. Now, while Correa and Thomas actually do try to distinguish between these two moments that uh, given social identity theory, uh, we might expect to have different, uh, 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 different levels of identity salience or different uh, uh, identity salience uh, uh, moments, then the, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, they're, they're the only authors in this group uh, that actually distinguish between those two, uh, those two questions. And while they do address a potential pool factor, uh, and that is the a Clinton era executive order that mandated more recruitment and hiring of Latinos in, federal, uh, uh, in the federal workforce, they ignore the other end of that, and that's the potential push factors uh, uh, being the context of the sending communities, to borrow uh, from the language that we use to talk about migrants themselves. And the context isn't great. So, as you see here, this chart 
uh, looks at the percent of people 25 years and over who have completed high school by race and ethnicity between 1975 and 2017. Latinos on the green line fall below, markedly, uh, blacks and non-Latino whites, historically. And this trend continues and is, as in, in fact, a bit worse when we look at college completion rates. Latinos consistently lag behind blacks and non-Latino whites. Now, when it comes to uh, median household income, while Latinos do slightly better, are doing slightly better, and have consistently uh, over blacks, both groups, both minority groups, lag consistently behind non-Latino whites. These are national? These are national level, yes. And, and I was, I'm sorry about that, I was just about to get to that. When we look at the border communities themselves, these rates are exacerbated. So in border communities where the majority of Latino immigration agents uh, uh, hail from, uh, unemployment consistently rates higher than the nationwide average. Uh, uh, shortly after the, the uh, economic downturn in 2008, we see an 11.5% unemployment rate versus 79 uh, for non-Latino whites. Um, which suggests that the recovery time among Latinos in border communities um, was a bit longer than it was for other members of the community. Higher poverty rates, 23.6% versus 14.8% at the nationwide rate, as high as 35% in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas in 2012. And of course, low educational attainment with college completion rates among the lowest uh, among all racial and ethnic groups. These figures actually, uh, uh, this context um, actually paints an, a, a clear picture of why Latinos enter these agencies when we look at compensation rates for these agencies. Where Border Patrol agents start at close to $46,000 per year and uh, veteran Immigration and Customs Enforcement agents in the 13 years since it's existed, 15 years since it's exi existed, are making over six figures per year without a college degree. So to get at this question of why Latinos uh, enter immigration law enforcement agencies and to actually uh, explore why these, uh, 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 this extant scholarship had not actually drilled down on this particular part of the process, I spent uh, 13 months in the field with immigration and customs enforcement agents across three states uh, between November of 2014 and December of 2015. And utilizing multiple entry snowball sampling, uh, I conducted interviews with 61 uh, Latino immigration agents. Uh, these interviews were conducted in, and this is a part of a broader project that included uh, 39 non-Latino agents. Um, the interviews were conducted in agency field offices, agents' homes, and public locations. Um, and the entire time, the goal for me was to provide agents with the space to share their stories. So my approach was to explain to them, I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to, uh, to tell you that what you're doing is wrong. I just want to understand what it is that you do on a daily basis and what brought you to this point in your career. And they trusted me. Maybe it's because, as Louise said, I'm, uh, I, I'm nice. <laughs> I hope. But what the preliminary uh, uh, data shows is that the identity or self-selection argument that is made by previous scholarship is wholly insufficient for explaining why Latinos go into immigration enforcement. According to Josiah Heyman, uh, who says, again, that Latinos go into these agencies because they lack a connection to um, the immigrant experience or that they're um, immigration restrictionists would suggest that everybody should be in this gray square. But as you can see, a majority of the sample actually, uh, close to three quarters, express high connection to the immigrant experience and more than half express lim liberal immigration attitudes. Pushing beyond this, what I did was 
uh, I wanted to get a sense of where these agents were actually coming from, and so I uh, grabbed the five modal counties of origin for uh, the agents, and that covered counties one, two, three, four, five, covered 44 of the 61 agents that I talked to, and three out of these five are border counties. And what we see is, what you see in the reference lines is basically the nationwide rates uh, of high school completion for uh, non-Latino whites and the nationwide uh, rate of high school completion among Latinos nationwide. And four out of the five counties lag behind that with only one exceeding that number, but of course all five lag behind the non-Latino white rate. The same for college completion, with three of the counties falling below the nationwide rate among Latinos, and of course above the unemployment rate of uh, uh, non-Latino whites, with three of the counties uh, uh, not boasting, but having uh, higher rates of unemployment than Latinos nationwide. Median household income, also three of the counties fall below uh, the nationwide average among Latinos, and of course all of them fall below the nationwide average among non-Latino whites. The family poverty rate, sorry to, to, to blaze through these, but obviously they're, they're, they're pretty uh, easy to understand here with, uh, with the red and black. Uh, family poverty rate, three of the counties uh, have higher rates of family poverty uh, than the Latino nationwide rate, and all of them of course higher than the, the rate among uh, non-Latino whites nationwide. In the aggregate, nearly three-fourths, or 44 of 61 agents, explicitly cited during our interviews that the reason they enlisted in immigration law enforcement wasn't about immigration attitudes or uh, because they'd forgotten who they were or they didn't, they, they didn't feel any kind of attachment or uh, sense of their ethnic identity, but because of money a stable job, and benefits. Among them were people like Carla Linares. She's 42 and she was a former Border Patrol agent who now works for ICE. Border Patrol was an available job after teaching for six months, so she tried teaching. She didn't have the uh, education to go to be a nurse, uh, but she tried teaching, found out it wasn't for her, and so opted for a job with Border Patrol. And of course she says in her hometown, it's either those three. Sonia Duran, who dreamed as a child of growing up to be a fashion designer, um, and ultimately found that that wasn't going to be possible given the economic circumstances of her family and the education that she, she had, uh, you know, kind of prohibited her from uh, being a doctor or anything like that, as she said. But I can do this. Lalo Rivera, what's gonna provide for your family? Yeah, it'd be nice to have a career where you look forward to going to work every day, but when that Golden Eagle shits in your account every two weeks and you see how much it's leaving, you're like, all right, it's like you're paying me this much for that. Now, even here, Lalo Rivera was quite a harsh <laughs> uh, critic of the current immigration policy environment. He was someone that we would categorize as an immigration restrictionist. But of course, that wasn't why he enlisted. And that was pretty clear for me. It was just, uh, uh, he literally said, this was a, a chance for a career because I was a beer wholesaler and that was not, that didn't have any kind of long-term job security and I wasn't making a pension and now I am. But again, it goes to show that even among restrictionists, they kind of fall back on this economic self-interest narrative and this, uh, uh, this very simple inclination for why they enlisted in these agencies. To illustrate how much of a restrictionist he is, he uh, uh, repeatedly referred to new immigrants as basura or as trash. Daniel Mireles, um, as some of you may have been at my job talk, is someone that I really, really connected with uh, during my time in the field. Uh, probably spent more time with him than anybody else, and, uh, and as a consequence, he's kind of loomed uh, really large in my thoughts on 
how I continue to develop this work and uh, on what, what I'm really doing with this work and what I owe this community that, uh, that invited me in uh, to their midst. Uh, but Daniel, you know, became a father at age 16. <laughs> Um, and basically struggled and stumbled through the end of high school. He, he uh, uh, in that sense, reminded me a lot of the people that I grew up with in Brownsville, um, people that, friends of mine who went on to do the exact same things that he did. When I went off to college, they went off to the military. And when I went off to grad school, they were starting work with ICE. But Daniel, growing up as someone that lived in Mexico and, and was a, a cross-border commuter to go to high school, uh, explained that it was just a job to him. It's not something that I wanted to do, that I wanted to fight illegal immigration, you know, it's just something that the opportunity opened itself. I mean, I do my job, I do it as best as I can, but I'm not going to sell my soul to it. Gerardo Fuentes, uh, the child of un an undocumented single father, uh, even went so far as to say, if I wasn't doing this, I'd be doing construction. But wanted to make it perfectly clear to me that when he became an agent, it was, he was just so happy that he was able to make it. He didn't think it would be immigration related, but it just happened to be that. Now, CJ Juarez uh, was a really interesting case. He, uh, well, we, were, we started our conversation about what brought him to this line of work. He actually started in on uh, a narrative that, that played up his role in being somewhat a, a, of a, a moderating force in the agency. He, he, he said, you know, if, if, if it's not for people like us on the inside, then who's going to stand up for all of us? And in the, that moment, of course, linking himself with the uh, immigrant community that he interacts with on a daily basis. And so I pushed him on this and asked him, so, so literally this was, this was why you joined. You wanted to change the agency from the inside and this was his response. But, and, and I applauded him for the honesty, is that his sights were actually a little lower than that. I was just hoping for a federal job. I wanted to get back in with the government. I wanted those benefits. I wanted something secure with benefits that I could support myself and my family. Growing up on the border, government jobs were the gold standard. If you could get a government job, you know, those folks I knew, they lived on the nice side of town. They lived good. So I thought, if I can do that, if I can get a government job, so like I said, I started applying everywhere. He said he even applied at the post office. So why do we care? <laughs> to uh, some people, I, I think this might be a, a kind of intuitive story. I thought it was an intuitive story. Uh, and then imagine my surprise, like Donald Trump, and slap a sad stamp on me, uh, to find that the literature that had been written, these studies that had focused on Latino immigration agents, didn't focus on this, but focused instead on arguably the more sexy narrative that Latinos are self-hating racists, or they, you know, they've forgotten where they came from, tienen el nopal, and they, they, you know, they, don't, they don't see that. Um, but what I, I want to suggest here today is that it's really important that we recognize why Latinos go into these agencies. Because the unsystematic entry of Latinos into immigration law enforcement has created a kind of diversity within the agency that Exton Scholarship has suggested we should fund. So rather than just racial or ethnic diversity within the agency, we have Latino agents who have a different perspective on the migrant experience, who have a different level of connection to the people that they come into contact with than their non-Latino peers. And that has the potential to shape the way that they exercise their role as immigration agents. And as I go on to show in, in the broader book project, that is actually what happens. There are instances of these Latino agents actually stepping in when they see something uh, uh, wrong happening or refusing to follow orders and being insubordinate when they disagree with something that's been asked of them. So why is that important? 
Well, because during the Obama era under uh, the priority enforcement program and the focus on quote unquote felons and not families, policy essentially provided cover for these agents. They, it, it allowed them to opt into units where they were uh, uh, more likely to interact with people they could reasonably dismiss as threats to the community and quote unquote, not my people. People who, were, who could be, uh, it could reasonably be argued were, th were criminals. People who had come to the United States and uh, you know, crossing without papers wasn't their, their, their crime. Their crimes were whatever you know, a, a rap sheet you know, listed on it, which I had plenty of agents pull out, agent, uh, pull out uh, rap sheets and show me, look, this guy's got X, Y, Z, all of these things that he's done when he got here. Um, and in other instances, it, it allowed agents to opt into units where they weren't out knocking on doors. They weren't out arresting people and they were working in units dedicated to service, dedicated to helping migrants adjust their status, uh, 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 file for appeals, and actually maintain their living situation in the United States, provided that they routinely checked in at the ICE uh, field office. And then comes the president, the current president. So what we've seen is this uh, uh, immense policy shift over the last year and a half. Um, and we see it in the news with ICE breaking down doors in Ithaca, New York, where I earned my PhD, um, in Jersey, all over the uh, southwest borderlands, in Iowa. ICE is uh, unleashed under uh, the Trump administration. And the focus on felons and not families and the uh, uh, reticence to go after what the agency terms as incidentals or people who aren't on a list of tar uh, target list of criminal aliens, um, but undocumented nonetheless, means that agents are in a situation now where they might be in situations where they have to uh, go after or apprehend or deport people that they don't actually believe deserve to be deported. Um, which in my, at least at this point, anecdotal evidence suggests that Latino agents, the most uh, um, the ones who connect most with the immigrant experience, the ones who are most sympathetic to uh, the plight of migrants, are more likely to exit, leaving behind only those agents that fit into that bottom right quadrant that Heyman, uh, Josiah Heyman suggests is all ICE agents. Um, and from a normative perspective, we should want more Latino agents like the ones that I interviewed here in these positions. We could argue on that some, but, uh, but that's my perspective from having spent this time with these people. So moving forward, what I've got right now, and I'm sorry I don't have the data to show you today, but I've got a FOIA uh, request in process uh, to get data from the agency on the uh, demographics at the micro level uh, going all the way down to the uh, uh, field office and uh, regional office level uh, to actually, and it's the most recent data that they have, uh, to actually get a sense of any kind of demographic shifts that have happened since the Obama administration left and the new policy environment took hold under the Trump administration. Uh, broader book project, the broader uh, 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 work that I've done suggests that there will be a, uh, a shift here. And like I said, in my anecdotal conversations with agents, um, in just texting people to see how things are going. Oh, sorry, David, I no longer work with ICE. I've transitioned to another agency. I just didn't like what we were doing. Or uh, agents, you know, transitioning to another federal law enforcement agency that's not dedicated to immigration alone. Um, like I said, that's anecdotal for now, but uh, as soon as this data uh, comes to my inbox, then I'm hoping to uh, uh, add that to the tail end of this piece. So thank you all so much for listening. I really appreciate it. And of course, comments, questions, suggestions uh, are welcome. My email and follow me on Twitter. <laughs> Thank you very much.
great. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask you about that last comment you made about hardware policies, uh -huh. and that you expect that uh, Latino border patrol agents who are most connected to the immigration experience, that you expect them to uh, be more likely to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain a little bit more about that? So why you would expect them to leave and not expect them to stay and work with, you know, relearn the policy environment under Trump and then work as some sort of veto or obstructionist uh, player within the system? So, uh, thank you, Juan. I really appreciate that. I, and it's a good question. I, um, I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about this. And, and so, my my initial inclination, like I said, is to expect that that some of the agents are uh, are going to be more likely to opt out. But I don't want to say all of them will. I don't want to make a, a, a I'm not making a causal claim here because everything that I presented before getting to that last slide still stands, right? A lot of these agents um, under again the Obama era policy talked about even being in those units where they were dealing with uh, uh, people that they could reasonably dismiss as criminals, excuse me, would say, but I still feel bad. I feel bad a lot. I wrestle with this. I struggle with the fact that, you know, maybe this person deserves a second chance. Maybe uh, deportation isn't a, uh, uh, an appropriate level of punishment uh, for what they've done. Or I had certain agents even saying, maybe driving under the influence isn't a crime, <laughs> which again, debatable. Um, and so the argument that I'm making is that, but then they would go on to say, I, I feel bad and it, it, it uh, costs me sleep at night. Um, I had agents talking about losing their hair uh, we were talking about Francisco Cantu, the author, the Border Patrol agent who just uh, wrote this uh, memoir, uh, the Line Becomes a River, talking about grinding his teeth out. Um, but they still come back to this, but what am I going to do, quit? Um, how am I, then, then I'm not going to be able to provide for my family, and what do I do then? Um, the thing is that there are, there are pathways out. Um, and I, what I expect is that not everybody will opt out, but they're, they're, we will see this uh, transitioning out at least. Even one of the agents that I've talked to uh, preliminarily said uh, that he was just jumping from one side of ICE to the other, jumping to HSI. And so there we're not dealing in, uh, they do deal in trafficking, human trafficking, but it's commodity tra uh, trafficking there. Uh, and so, you know the, the 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 broader the broader book project actually goes into uh, a, a more in-depth exploration of coping mechanisms, right? Because that's what's actually happening: is that agents are finding ways to minimize the degree to which their ethnic identity becomes activated in these encounters, and shut that down. Because of course they want to minimize the tension and the conflict that they experience. Um, and so I think the transition to the Trump era, uh, the change is so uh, uh, um, violent given the rationale that people use to kind of cope throughout the Obama era that that, that transition uh, is, is going to cause people uh, to, to find it even more difficult to, uh, you know, to, to, to to minimize that tension. I have a question about your understanding of the path mm. of attitudinal predisposition, whether that's a question. Do these agents come with a predisposition to question the harsher proportions of their affordability, or is there another factor to see that as one path? Another one is, a set of agents comes in, I'm coming to get a job, I'll do my best, I'll try to care. But based upon their experiences, mm -hmm. they're, they're put into situations where they come to this mm -hmm. at some point, and certainly there are those, the ones we just talked about, that reach a threshold level, who say, I can't 
can't do this anymore. Yeah. I have to move, shift to another, another agency. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see this as more of a predisposition or one based on experience once they have the responsibility of the agents talk about? It? That's, a, that's actually a really fascinating question that, that I haven't actually phrased it in that way before or put it to myself that way before. Um, so the, I think the unifying uh, uh, factor in the, looking at the way that agents respond once they're actually on the job um, is not so much even the, the ethnic identification, the, the specific term they use, you know, I'm a Latino, I see myself as linked to other Latinos, or this, or this sense of linked fate, but it is a connection to the immigrant experience. Uh, it is an, ab uh, an ability to see themselves on the same uh, pathway as the migrant they come into contact with, just, you know, several years or a couple generations removed. Uh, and so I think there is that predisposition, right, that, that, that comes loaded with their own connection to their immigrant history. Uh, because the agents who were most, most hardline were the ones who uh, would immediately tell you, oh, yeah, my great-grandparents crossed whoever knows how long ago, and I don't know. I've always been American. You know, my family's American. Um, and, um, or people who would, who would explain that their family had done things the right way and, you know, adamant about. We did things, my parents got in line and took care of everything they needed to from Mexico, and, and then they crossed. Um, so there are these kind of, uh, uh, there is somewhat of a predisposition. I expected, uh, given my political science background and my, my uh, kind of immersion in the street level bureaucracy work, that what I was gonna see was a certain level of, of, of uh, routinization and jadedness over time. Uh, and so people ultimately, tire of uh, hearing sob stories or tire of uh, uh, actually internalizing some of the feelings they, they are, are kind of, yeah, internalizing the feelings they get from having sympathy from some, for somebody. Um, and there's a, a wealth of, of scholarship on that kind of uh, the making of bureaucrats. Um, but I actually did not see that to as large an extent as I did uh, uh, see this frequent activation of agents' ethnic identities. And so uh, that was another element of this, was that agents did find ways to minimize the activation of that. And so, uh, as is a, a strong commitment of mine in this work, is that their connection to their ethnic identity or the role of their ethnic identity and what they did fluctuated over time. Uh, and so you have these uh, uh, assessments being made or these uh, uh, lines of distinction being drawn between who's deserving and who's really not, uh, which somewhat falls in line with this kind of uh, routinization. But, um, but what I expected to see more of, I did not actually find. And, and it was a question that came up often. I would, I would talk to agents who had transitioned to these units where uh, the people that they're dealing with are, are hardened criminals. So they're on field operation teams um, and or the violent criminal alien program. So they're on prosecutions. I would ask them, has transitioning to this unit and seeing these rap sheets time and time, day after day after day, has that changed the way that you think about immigration? And I, and I would go back to this refrain that, uh, you know, the, the famous quote from Donald Trump, uh, uh, with his rapists uh, uh, and criminals comment um, of, and I assume some of them are good people. And so I would pose that question to agents uh, um, every time was, are the majority of them good people and some of them criminals or is it the other way around? Is it like Donald Trump says it is? And the majority would acknowledge that it's, you know, even the people who were on those units would say, this is not everybody. This is a small subset, um, and a lot of times that's what, you know, that's why the agents would kind of come back to this uh, refrain of, that's why we're sitting on our hands. Because when we're not going after the people that uh, are just here uh, undocumented, who haven't committed any other crimes, 
who are flying under the radar or just here to make a better life for themselves, we don't have anybody to go after. Yes, sorry, she had her hand up before Luis. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, um, the first the first question. Um, so, among ICE agents too, there's there's uh, there's this kind of uh, uh, typical process that happens where uh, you are ending up with more Latino agents in these borderland areas, and more of them are from closer to those field offices uh, than anyone else. Right. So. Uh, you do have transplants, and, and, and in South Texas, I uh, would go into a field office or a local regional office, and uh, the agents would say, well, yeah, of course it's all Latinos or Mexicanos here, uh, because none of the other people want to stay. They come down here, they use it as a stepping stone, and then they're oh, up to Austin or up to Dallas. Uh, you know, they don't want to be down here. They don't speak the language, which there's, uh, you know, I developed this more in my book. I, again, there's this relationship between the Latino agents and the non-Latino agents that there is a fair amount of judgment. There, th this project, and, and, and Luis uh, alluded to it earlier about uh, the title of the book uh, uh, tentatively is Broken Mirrors. There is a lot of parallels between the migrant experience and uh, the Latinos that work in these uh, agencies, right? So even the story that I've told you here where Latinos are just looking for a better life and willing to do any work that someone's willing to offer them and do the, get the best amount of pay they can for the work that they're doing. Um, but you have Latino agents talking about transplant agents from up north. Not, you know, how, why are they here if they can't even speak the language? Um, why did you come into this line of work if, if you don't even know, you know why people come to this country? Uh, so, so a whole lot of uh, almost uh, nativist light judgment about the people that are transplants to the areas. Um, but I think it, it goes a little bit further than that. So what I talked to you all about here today is why Latinos elect to work for these agencies. What this story actually doesn't completely tell is, or, or, or what this... Uh, um, what this evidence doesn't actually uh, uh, bear out is how we explain the disproportionate number of Latinos who work in these agencies. Uh, so this story doesn't actually explain why uh, the highest proportions of Latinos that work in the federal uh, workforce are all here. And as a part of a chapter in, in the book, it actually traces the institutional side of the story. So again, to parallel the migrant story, you have people looking for a better job, looking for economic opportunity, and so they go and fill these positions, but at the same time, you have the state actually looking for this kind of labor because they want the essentially uh, tool belt that comes from hiring Latino agents. So they want 
the Latino, or they want an agent who knows the area. They want an agent who speaks the language. They want an agent who can quote unquote think like a Mexican. Um, dating as far back as 1924, I, 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 for, this, for that chapter, I, I poured over uh, internal agency reports from the INS dating as far back as 1915. And in 1924, a border patrol sector chief in Brownsville writes to Washington to the uh, uh, commissioner of immigration to say, we need reinforcements down here, but we could really use people who A, speak the language, uh, who are familiar with the terrain, and C, which I haven't been able to figure out exactly what this means, but are quote unquote temperamentally fit for this line of work. Um, and, and the agents that I spent time with actually talk about this. They talk about the fact that their own ethnic identity is a tool for them. Uh, one of them alluded to a, a, an agent that I had talked to who's not Latino. It was this 6'5", huge, you know, uh, uh, muscle-bound dude with a bunch of tattoos and just scary-looking uh, guy. And the Latino agent that I talked to after him said, uh, you know, that's the hammer. You know, you, you, you know, but you don't send the hammer to knock on the door. Because the second that dude knocks on the door, Nobody's going to open it. But for me, when I walk up there and I knock on the door, they open it and they say, Oh, si, pasale mijo. Come on in. Because they recognize him as a co-ethnic. They see him as part of the community. And the agency capitalizes on that. Uh, the agency has uh, essentially been able to continue existing, I think, over the long term because they've embedded themselves and submerged themselves in the community. They become an institution. And so uh, one of the conversations that happened the last time I, I presented this uh, two weeks ago was, you know, should we even be talking about uh, what kind of agents we want in these agencies? Uh, because I think we should, the person in the audience said, I think we should be talking about abolition. Get rid of the agency. Um, and again, normatively speaking, there's an argument for that. We could, we could have that argument, and, and, and political theorists have spent a lot of time, I think, poring over that question of whether a, a, a civil deportation force is in keeping with democratic norms. But my response to that gentleman was, until you actually uh, uh, make up for the boon to the economy that these institutions are in these areas where they're already economically depressed, um, with policy targeted at jobs and education, then you can't abolish these agencies because you'll, uh, at least from my perspective, you'll collapse these economies. Um, and, and so there's a, 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 a huge amount of uh, uh, exploitation essentially going on, bureaucratic exploitation uh, on behalf of the federal government basically using the ethnic identities of these people. I know I've gone off on somewhat of a tangent, but I think it's all uh, really related. Um, because you do see that, where these Latino agents are all kind of clustered in these particular areas because people come down and they, they, don't, they don't stay. Time for maybe one more question. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm rambling a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so really quick, um, CJ met George Lopez one time, and it was one of his favorite stories to tell. Of course, everybody loves a, a good celebrity story, right? But he literally said uh, that George asked me what I did, and I told him, and then he wouldn't leave me alone all night and pinche migra and this and that, you know, like being, of course, being very George Lopez, but, you know, making it known that, that he didn't agree with that. Gerardo actually uh, uh, recalled being spat on, uh, called um, a coconut, having people yell at him, hey, your family should be proud. Um, let's see. 
Well, I guess I don't have him in there. There's an, another agent who actually, uh, his name's Guillermo, um, who actually talked about how he used to be really involved in his local community, uh, going to city functions and, and uh, participating with the church. And when he took this job, he stopped. Um, he recoiled from the community, not because anyone actually said anything to him. Uh, he said he wasn't even positive that um, anyone knew what he did, but he felt like he was doing something wrong. And so you have this kind of recoiling from the community, and I, I even asked him, I was like, do you still feel connected, though, to the culture? And he said, of course, I'm always going to feel connected to it. It's, it's, it's who I am, but I just don't want to put myself in a situation where someone's going to think that I'm there and I'm going to start trouble. And also, I don't want people saying anything ugly to me. Uh, so again, it's just this, this constant state of in-betweenness, or what I uh, use the term liminality for, you know, uh, to explain how these people uh, experience this intersection between who they are and what they do. Um, and, um, and of course, I, I found that fascinating. The majority of agents would talk about how I don't tell anybody what I do. Um, or I tell people I work for Coca-Cola, because who doesn't love Coca-Cola? <laughs> So I think this, uh, not to toot my own horn, I think I'm supposed to do it and say that this work, that, that the broader book project uh, has a lot of uh, implications for that literature specifically. So I am uh, really familiar with that literature because that's where this started. That's where a lot of the ideas and that's where uh, my engagement with this literature on how does race or ethnic identity shape the way that police um, encounters uh, with the public uh, uh, essentially end up like the, the, you know, the, 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 the tone of those interactions. Um, and how police officers essentially balance their own connection to a community uh, and uh, their kind of institutional role. And that literature is actually littered with uh, inconsistency. So you see uh, one author will say, uh, or one study will find, oh yes, race and ethnic identity of the agent, of the officer, actually shapes these kind of interactions. And then someone will respond with, that's not what we found. And others will say, you know, it, it just goes back and forth and it waffles back and forth. And then there's some, some you know, measurement issues there and, and what people are really testing. But my argument for that is that what they're really finding is that, you know, uh, identity is situationally contingent, right? And there are, uh, again, uh, sorry to keep referencing, uh, referring back to the broader book project, but in these interactions with people who look and talk just like you and you know you have this kind of ethnic or racial connection with or experiential connection with uh, there are you know any number of reasons not to see yourself as linked to them um, and people draw distinctions between who's deserving of my you know of my closing of the empathy gap and who isn't uh, and so I think that's why you see uh, this back and forth. And, and so uh, I think embedding uh, yourself in these kind of communities or in these kind of uh, uh, universes is a, is a good opportunity for kind of teasing out that uh, mechanism, if you will, right? What actually goes into determining uh, the degree to which somebody actually sees themselves as connected and that, and, and that they act on that. Thank you. Thank you.